Hello and welcome again for our um, Kanwath and Costairs Parish Church Zoom online service. Well, you might be Zooming right now or you are watching it through YouTube, but whatever means you are here, we would like to say thank you for tuning in. Thank you that today when we are starting our Lent, well, we started Lent on Ash Wednesday, but this is the first Sunday in our Lent season. We have started this journey along with Jesus Christ. And the first Sunday in our lecture reading today is all about when Jesus go in the wilderness, driven by or drove by Holy Spirit. I am not sure how many people have experienced the proper wilderness. Being a city boy, I have hardly experienced it. Sometimes I am even still afraid of dark. And today, we are in the Custes village and this is the wild is lime walk and as you can see the background we are in the wild I know when Jesus was in the wilderness there might not be any light you can still see this torch on my face but when Jesus was in the wilderness there may not be any light apart from the moon or the sun Jesus was with wild beast and even the presence of Satan was there Today, I'm just bringing you here to see that what the wilds look like. It's all dark. And this, these trees are really daunting too. But I'm trying to experience a small percentage of what Jesus must have experienced when he was in the dark. There might not be no shelter. It might be raining and windy like this today. There might be a storm in those 40 days. We don't know. What I would like to share with you and what I want to experience is just a one small glimpse of what Jesus might have experienced in this time. So let's take just a moment of silence. Just forget about everything else and think what's what we'd like to do in this hour. What if you want to see God face to face today through our worship? Be still. call us to journey today and every day following Jesus wherever he leads us Lent call us to worship together to tell future generation the good news to bring God's hope to all people then call us to be faithful living to trust the one who gives us life Lent call us to journey with God so let's worship God who walks with us today and every day. Amen. Shall we continue and start the worship and sing our first hymn, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Saviour. Pass Me Not, O Gentle Saviour. Again, the words will be, the lyrics will be on the screen. Please sing along with them and reflect on it. Pass Me Not, O Gentle Saviour.
bow down our heads in prayer. That at the outer limit of Lent, we are called to walk, called to walk to the paper thin edges which cuts us to the soul, to the workplaces which weary us, to the people who confuse us, to the faith which confronts us. Here at the corner of steadfast love and faithfulness, we are called to wait, called to wait when our clenched stomachs awaken us in the moments of unbearable sorrow. With the angels who would carry us there where time is fulfilled, where God's kingdom is as near to us as our neighbors, we begin Lent. With the beloved whose tears wash away our fears, with the God who will not let go of our hands, never forget that we will have to face the wilderness in the parts of our life anyways. Jesus Christ boldly, boldly faced the wilderness. It's dangerous and wonders. It's, he struggled. He struggled with his mission to make known God's loving purposes for all people. Guarded and guided by God's Spirit. He was triumphant and began to proclaim the gospel and the hope that he reign of God would bring oppression to and to end and deliverance for those held captive. Lord Jesus Christ, your victory in the desert assures us that as you followed the way of the cross, there were victories over evil in its many forms until its powers were broken on the cross and you were raised triumphant forever. Grant us vision and courage that in our time we may recognize and struggle with all oppressing and dehumanizing forces in this world and become sign of the inbreaking of the reign of God. All this we pray in the name of Jesus and say the prayer he taught the world to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may I please request Ian to read our New Testament reading today. The first lesson comes from the Gospel according to Mark chapter 1 
reading from verses 9 to 15. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the River Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Amen. The second lesson is taken from Peter's first epistle, chapter 3, reading from verses 18 to 22. For Christ died for our sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolises baptism that now saves you also. Not to remove the dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities and powers, in submission to him. Amen. Thanks be to God for these readings of his holy word. To his name be all honour and glory. So, a few years ago, a farmer owned land along the Atlantic seacoast. He constantly advertised for some higher hands, some labour to work in his farm. Like most people, who are very reluctant to work for on farms along the Atlantic. Why? They dreaded an awful storms that rage across the Atlantic wrecking havoc on the building and the crops. As the farmer interviewed applicants for the job, he received always a steady stream of refusals. Now finally, a short and thin man, well past his middle age, approached this farmer. So farmer asked, are you a good farm hand? Well, the gentleman, the little man replied, well, I can sleep when the wind blows. Well, farmer was although puzzled by this answer, the farmer was desperate for this help of hired hand, so he hired him. The little man worked well around the farm, busy from dawn to dusk, and the farmer felt very satisfied with this man's work, and he was thinking to maybe increase his wages, his salary. But one day, or say sorry, one night, the wind howled loudly in from the offshore. Jumping out of bed, the farmer grabbed a lantern or maybe a torch and rushed next to the hired hand sleeping quarters. He shook the little man and yelled, Get up! Get up! A storm is coming! Tie things down before they blow away! The little man rolled over in bed and said firmly, No sir, I told you I can sleep when the wind blows. Well, Enraged by this response, angry by this response, the farmer was tempted to fire him on the spot. But instead of wasting his time, he hurried outside to prepare for the storm. To his amazement, he discovered that all of the haystack has been covered with trampoline. The cows were in the barn, the chickens were in the coops, and the doors were barred. The shutter was uh, tightly secured, and everything absolutely everything was tied down. Nothing could blow away. The farmer then understood what this higher hand meant. So he returned to his bed to also sleep while the wind blew because he was proud what he has done. He hired this man who said in the beginning that I can sleep. I can sleep when the wind blow. So when we are prepared spiritually when we are prepared mentally and physically, we have nothing to fear. Can we sleep when the wind blows through our life? The hired hand in this story was able to sleep because he had secured the farm against the storm. We secure ourselves against the storms of life by guarding ourselves 
in the word of God and guided by the Holy Spirit. We don't need to understand. We just need to hold his hand, Jesus' hand, to have peace in the middle of the storm. I hope you understood the real meaning of this story I would like to share with you. May we just walk with, with the hand which was, which was nailed on the cross because Jesus is still happy to hold our hand with that hand as well and just walk with us and take us to this wilderness journey to reach us, to take us to the heavenly place He has created for us. God bless you all. Let's sing our second hymn, How Sweet the Name. Our second hymn, How Sweet the Name. Thank you. How sweet So this Tuesday, last Tuesday, Elizabeth orga kindly organized a uh, boys brigade and she was celebrating this pancake and tried to teach the kids about the, um, about the wilderness of Jesus and what kind of sacrifices Jesus made. So Isaiah was there and then their mom is starting to prepare this pancake and he did pre pancake as well and he prepared it for, for his brother as well. But when the time come of eating, both wants the first pancake. 
As I said, I want the first pancake. And Alija said, I want the first pancake. Well, their mom thought it's better to teach them a lesson, a moral lesson. And she said, well, Isaiah, what do you think, boys? What do you think? If Jesus would have been there, what he would have done? He would have given the first pancake to their brother, to his brother. So Isaiah said to Elijah, Elijah, why don't you be Jesus today? <laughs> well, boys, always boys, isn't it? So today we are going to talk about the wilderness. I first learned, I first learned the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness when I was in my Sunday school. And I think most of us heard this story when we were in Sunday school. However, I was privileged to work in YMCA, YMCA Delhi uh, in India, and it's called Easter Pageant. Easter Pageant and I was a disciple. So when I was in my, I think I was in my secondary school when I acted in this Easter Pageant as a disciple. A young boy is still afraid of dark and Satan's big horn was standing and trying to understand, like I was confused, why Jesus? Why Jesus even here in this wilderness and tolerating this man called Satan, who is the source of all the evil? Our director was narrating the scene and trying to convince us that we are just going to act and this is not happening in real life. At one side, we have well-dressed up and harmless looking devil, skinny, all black suited, smoke coming out from his red horns, black horns, and four tailed reaching for a loaf shaped stone, challenging, tempting Jesus. And to his, his side, a supremely undisturbed Jesus towered over the landscape in a pristine white robe, his finger pointed devastatingly at his tempter. To be fair, our narrator, our director was doing the best he could do to ease us into this story that might have frightened the young ones greatly. And I always give him credit for that. But I feel, I feel there was a problem. And I feel there is a problem in our traditional view of this wilderness and Jesus' trial. What I observed there and even in my other previous experiences on Sunday morning was a superhero version of Jesus Christ that left no room for his humanity. At one point in my childhood or young adulthood, and maybe this is same same case for you too, it did not occur to us that Jesus actually struggled in this wilderness. That he got hurt, that he hungered, that he wept thirst, wrestled, and suffered in the wilderness. Not for just one or two days, but 40 long days. Instead, I assume that his triumphant over evil was an inevitable conclusion, a kind of trial that cost him absolutely nothing. It has taken my whole childhood and maybe later age to shed the superhero Jesus of my childhood. However, I sometimes still long for him and my innocent faith on him too. I long for his divinity, the certainty of it, the mighty magical promise of it, just to overwhelm his humanity like a bright and reassuring aura or crown. But Lent isn't a season of unshakable superheroes here. It is a season for wonderful, Vulnerable creatures whose wilderness journey are never easy or straightforward. It is a season of shadow. A season when our certainties go down, go down the fire and burn down to just ashes. It is a season of vulnerability, honesty, humility and repentance. Well, all of that to say, to read Jesus' wilderness story as a story of superficial triumph is to miss the point. Why? Why? Because we need the Jesus of the desert. When we read the Revelation chapter 5 verses 9 to 12, here the host of heaven are worshipping the Lamb precisely because he was slain, killed and slaughtered. And it says, and they sang a new song. Uh, they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, 
you purchase for God's person from every nation. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. So now we know before the crown that Jesus wrestled with real demons and real danger during those 40 days of temptation and on the cross. As I said, right now I am in this wilderness, but I have no fear that the wild beasts can come and grab me. What I know is we have foxes, deer, and maybe the most, might, most dangerous thing here is, is a badger. So I'm not scared, but that's not the story with Jesus. As tempting as it might be to cling to a divine superhero, we need the Jesus who tolerated a, a terrain where the Holy Spirit, where the Satan, the wild beast, and the angel resided together. Isn't it strange that the Holy Spirit, Satan, the wild beast, and the angels raised, uh, uh, resided together? I think it is because we never imagine this figure that in the wilderness as the most deprived area even the angels can survive in the, even the angels will live alone we will never survive we will never survive such a dangerous place but with a companion yes with the companion who knows the way we will Matthew Mark and Luke they offer they offers us no colorful details about Jesus' experience in this wilderness. We don't know what Satan's specific temptation were or how Jesus responded to them at least. All Mark gives us here are a few short sentences. The Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days tempted by Satan. He was with the wild beast and angel waited on him. Now reflected on Mark's version of the story, I would just like to share three thoughts with you which just stand out for me. So my first thought is that Jesus didn't choose the wilderness, did he? The Spirit of God drove him, compelled him, forced him into the desolation of a wild and this unsafe place. Jesus didn't want to go. And it is very possible that he even resisted. But the Spirit drove him anyway. I sometimes smile when people say that God will never force anyone to do anything against their will. I don't know how far this statement is true. Well, I sometimes feel strange to find these wilderness experience of Jesus comforting. Comforting for me. Why? Because this sounds true to life. Most of the time, we don't choose to enter the wilderness, do we? And if we do, there must be something wrong if you do that, isn't it? We don't volunteer for pain. We don't volunteer for loss, for danger, or for terror. But the wilderness, wilderness in our lives happens anyways. Whether it comes to us in the excuse of a devastating pandemic like today, a frightening hospital bed, or a report, or a broken relationship, a hurting child, or a loss of faith. The wilderness appears unplanned and unwelcome at our doorstep. And sometimes it is God's own spirit who drive us, who drive us there similar like he did to Jesus. Does this mean that God wills bad things to happen to us? Or that God wants us to suffer? And we start questioning why bad things happen to good people? No. Does it mean that God is ready to teach, shape and redeem us even during the most barren periods of our lives? Yes. In the startling economy of God, even a dangerous desert can become holy. Trust me, it can happen. Even in our wildest imagination, it can never happen. But in the, in the, in the schedule, in the economy of God, it could. Even our wilderness wanderings can reveal the divine. This is not because God takes pleasure in our pain, no, but because we continue to sin and we live in this chaotic, fragile and broken world that includes deserts. 
And because God's methods of procedures are to take the things of shadow and death and wiring, and wiring them from resurrection. Our, my second thought is our wilderness journey sometimes lasts very long, isn't it? Sometimes it takes ages to get the answer for, uh, for our prayers. Sometimes the pain is so long that we wait and ask when is going to finish. Well, maximum I have fasted without food is three days. I have never spent 40 days in solitude and definitely never in silence as you can imagine. I love talking. Neither in physical deprivation or danger I will spend more days. But I can still imagine that Jesus' time in the wilderness must have not passed quickly. Every second must have looked like an hour, every hour like a day, and day like years. He must have experienced each day as a battle of mind, of spirit, and of body. Maybe, again as I said, the hours stretched into years and the night just felt endless, especially when it is dark and maybe cold and with the wild, wild beasts. For those of us who live in an impatient, quick fix, quick fix culture, this aspect of the wilderness is daunting, isn't it? Because we tire and we despair so quickly. We start asking, why this pain not ending? Why our prayers are not are going unanswered? And where is God? We just start calling this, where is God? Maybe we need to ask a harder question though, to ask to ourselves that why did Jesus need the wilderness and so do we? Well, Mark's story began with an account of Jesus' baptism, as we have just read. When Jesus rose from the waters of the Jordan River, the heavens tore open and God announced Jesus' identity loud and very clear. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. With you, I am well pleased. At Jesus' baptism, Jesus heard the absolute truth about who he was and he has no doubt in that. That was the easy part, isn't it? Because it's God who is calling, who is, who is saying that from, uh, from the heaven. The much harder part came in the desert when, you, when he might not be able to hear his dad. When he had to face down every vicious mocking assault on that truth. As the memory of God's voice faded for him and the isolation of the wilderness played tricks on Jesus' heart and mind and on his body as well, he had to learn that he is still beloved. He is still beloved child of God because, because he knew and we should know this too that God's deep and unconditional belovedness and his love would never depend on our external circumstances. If those 40 days in the wilderness, is, it, 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 uh, it was a time of transformation, a time for Jesus to decide who he was and how he would live out his calling. So he chose. He chose deprivation over power, vulnerability over rescue, and obscurity over honor. At every instant in which he could have reached for the certain, for the extraordinary and for the miraculous, he reached out and said for the undependable, the quiet and the mundane. Of course, there is nothing easy about Jesus' choices here and we might be thinking this is awful. Sometimes we find them strange and appalling. Very often we prefer the miraculous intervention, the dramatic rescue and the long-awaited vindication. How often we find ourselves echoing the demand of this tempter, feed me, deliver me, prove yourself to me. How often we find the restraint of God offensive and frustrating. Sometimes we, like Jesus, we need to learn in the wilderness what it really means to be the child of God. Because the frightening truth is hard. And it is that we can be loved and uncomfortable at the same time. That it is that it can be, we can be loved and un un uncomfortable at the same time. We can be loved and vulnerable at the same time. In the wilderness, 
the love that survives could be harsh, not soft, salvific, destined to that salvation, but not sentimental. My most comforting point is the third one though. What is? There were angels in the wilderness. There were angels in the wilderness. Oh, thank God. I thank God that there are angels in the wilderness. So even in the land of shadow and starvation, even in the place where the wild beasts roamed, God's agent of love and care lingered. This could be the most startling and comforting truth for us, isn't it? If it, we can recognize, if we open our eyes and take a look around, even in the midst, even in the grimmest place, God abides. And somehow, without reason or explanation, helps come from nowhere. Rest comes from nowhere. Comfort comes from nowhere. Often our angels don't always appear in the form we prefer, trust me. But they do come. It happened to me. I do have personal experiences of these. What do our angels look like? We don't know. Do we recognize them when they show up? No. When they minister us? No. When they hold us? When they embrace us? Do we hear a new version of God's voice calling through them saying us? Beloved, if yes, then what would it be like to enter into someone else's barren desert right now and become an angel of their journey? As we begin our journey into Lent, may we experience the companionship of the Christ whose vulnerability became His and our strength. So may we enter with courage and uh, with the courage the desert we can't choose or avoid. May our long stretches with the wild beast teaches us who we really are, the most precious and beautiful children of God. And when the angels in all their sweet and secret guise whisper the name Beloved into our ears, may we listen and believe them. And believe in the Spirit and believe in the Word of God. May God bless you and bless your time of wilderness, of suffering, and be with you and hold your hand and takes you where he is. If you're fasting, it's good. If you're not, try to concentrate more on for these 40 days, more on the word of God and come nearer with his death, his crucifixion and his resurrection. May God bless you all. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Let's bow down our heads again and praying for everyone. Almighty God, be with us as we contend with our lives and all our challenges. Thank you for listening as we bring before you the troubles that undermines us. We are firm. It is written, one does not live by bread alone. Strengthen and sustain our families and our communities, especially Carstairs, and Conworth and Castells Junction and the neighboring areas, Lord. Nurture the bonds between us and inspire us to live with empathy and forgiveness. Help those struggling with work or facing uncertainty in their future that they may find peace in your abundant love. Jesus, our Redeemer, rescue us when we stumble because we proclaim it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Enable us to admit, admit the temptation of this world and support us to resist turning away from your teaching. Awaken us to recognize the gift you have given each one of us and to see the role we play or we can play in the healing of this creation, your world. Be with our leaders, our leaders and those around the world that they may act with compassion and generosity. Guide them to humbly serve, serve their own countries and to foster peace across our borders. God, our creator, inspire us, inspire us with renewed hope. We acknowledge it is written, 
do not put the Lord your God to the test. Please God deepen our faith, our faith to hear your word and follow only your ways. Encourage us to bring all our hopes and desire to you in prayer, that in lifting up our souls to you, we may be shaped by your love. Help us to hear the dialogue of prayer and to listen in prayers as much as we speak. Comfort those, Lord, those who are battling with Ill, Ill health to bear their pain and with patience, strength and courage. Holy Spirit, our Comforter, sustain us in our times of trials. All this we pray, Lord, by assured and assured by your eternal love. And we pray in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's unite our hearts once again for the offertory prayers. Now I know we are not offering in this time, in this morning maybe. We are offering with, with all other means. Some people with standing order, some people with free, uh, free will envelopes, some just with checks or donations. But whatever way you are offering and giving your commitment to God, I would just like to pray so that God can bless us on that uh, on that spirit of stupership let's pray god of the wilderness we give these offering in gratitude rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us we give these offering in faith O lord trusting that you will provide our own needs we give these offering in hope knowing you can use them to spread your love in this world. And with these offerings, we give ourselves. May we live with generous hearts with and with open hands. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's receive the blessing. So whatever wilderness the Spirit has brought you to, walk in boldness as a beloved child of God. Walk in peace 
under the shelter of the Most High. Walk in faith, knowing Christ walks with you. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.